topic, technology as a harbinger of quality standards in assessment and evaluation and international approach. I would like to call upon the panelists. Dr. Harshita Sharma, Founder Director, Brainstorm International, Maharashtra, India. She'll be moderating the session. Welcome, ma'am. A big hand, everybody, please. Garyasa, Garyasi Datta, Resident Trustee, the Downtown School, Guwahati, Assam, India. A warm welcome, ma'am. Dr. Vinod RR, Director, Training, Internship and Placements, Chinmaya Vishwa Vidya Peet, Kerala, India. Welcome, sir. And we have Madhuri Sawan, Managing Director and Founder, Brain Squads. Welcome, ma'am. Over to you, Harshita, ma'am. So very happy morning to all of you. We need some energy in the room. Can we all stand up? Come on, everybody. I think, yes, everybody has been waiting, waiting, waiting. So can we all stand up? Can we just wave the hands? OK. Now, I want you all to take a deep breath in and breathe out. Take a deep breath in and breathe out. I want you to clench your fist like this. Bring into your awareness, when is the last time did you feel confident? When is the last time did you feel confident? Just clench your fist, very confident, 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 confident. Breathe in and the whole scene is in front of you. When is the last time did you feel confident, 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 very confident? Breathe in the confidence. Breathe in the confidence. Wonderful, very nice. Right, so I think that's one thing which when we talk about the assessments and everything, how do you raise that energy for children? and where do we begin, right? Okay, so we all know that technology has transformed the field of assessment and evaluation processes. By providing the new ways to collect and analyze the data, improving the accuracy and the objectivity of the assessment and increasing, and increasing access to the educational opportunities. But still, I think there are a lot of learning gaps. Do you agree with me? Do you have any learning gaps? Or we are perfect with the assessment part which is there? What do you say, audience? Are there learning gaps? OK. Why do you think these learning gaps are there? Right? First of all, I think we all need to reflect on one thing. One thing which is, what is the purpose of the assessment? Right? Is it to measure students' learning or identify the learning gaps? Is it for the motivation and engagement with the feedback, or it is just to give some grades to the students? What is the purpose of assessment? Is it to provide feedback to teachers? What do you think? Yes? No? What it is? Is it feedback for parents, students, teachers? or to the students, what do you think the real situation should be? Can we make it little interactive? What do you think the real situation should be? Is it for the students? Is it for the teachers? Is it for the parents? Is it for the management? It's, it's, it's for everybody? OK. So keeping in mind all the stakeholders when we talk about, I think it becomes really, really challenging that how do we make an assessment which would be really, you know, you know, good for everybody which is there. Is it assessment, if you look at the word assessment which is there, it is typically when we talk about, is it something only with the academic things or is it something which is like, say, 
the overall achievement or what, what, how do you define the assessment? What are we assessing on? Is it the skills? Is it only the academic achievement? What it is? What are we assessing on? Understanding of the learning, the learning outcomes, uh, the understanding of the concept, and so on, which is there. Right? So how do you develop these assessment tools and the material which is there? Then, when we talk about what is the impact of the assessment on the, you know, self-esteem and the confidence of children, which is very, very important, which is there. Right? Are the assessment fair and equitable for all kinds of learners coming from the diverse background? Is it helping them? Or is it something which we are just revisiting those things again and again? Okay, this is what we need because our parents want this. This is what we need, you know, uh, what our teachers need, which is there. Right? So now if you look at the new pedagogies, and I think this is a constant research and development, and still there are gaps. In spite of a lot of research happening worldwide, there's a lot of you know, gaps in the assessments which are there. Now, do you think the teacher should know what to teach and how to teach, or they should know why to teach what they're teaching? What it should be? Is it why important, or what and how important? Excellent. That's what the, the NCF is talking about. You know, we always give those uh, lesson plans and, you know, material to teachers. This is what you need to do it. This is what you need to, you know, teach, which is there. So they know what, right? They know how to do it. You do activity-based. You have experiential learning. You have all of those things which are there. But then the why is always missing. And the why gives you a lot of answers to where we begin and how do we begin, which is there, right? So with this note, I think we have wonderful people with us and all coming with a various background sharing their insight on how we can make this more meaningful in terms of assessment. And it is not just when we're talking about not a report card and how we can make it holistic progress card for a child rather than making a report which is just analyzing that this is, you know, yes and no, this is this what it is. How we can make it as a holistic progress card? How we can make it where a child move from one level to another level of learning rather than, you know, just having the grades where a child is stuck into it, which is there. And that's what the new NCF talks about where, you know, instead of the grades and the marks, which we all you know, we know that in 1835, when it was started, it started with only the four levels of learning. But we do, then got into the race of with the grades and the marks and then the bell curve. And now again, we are coming back to the learning levels, which is again come back that after a lot of research that the learning levels are important rather than the marks and grades, right? So let's begin the panel and yes. Uh, So uh, we all know that technology plays a really, really an important role. And after the COVID, I think we all have started knowing how important the technology is. So beginning with you that, how can we have, you know, the technology which would be like used for having an assessment which could be fair and equitable for all the students or do you have anything in place which you're using for your college or your students which is there? Hello, Chick. First of all, uh, very good morning and uh, thank you uh, with three ladies uh, and me. So I'm, I'm happy and blessed <laughs> that I could listen more rather than talk. Uh, to the point, first we have to accept, appreciate and acknowledge that technology will be there, it will coexist. Second, part of the game, 
we all are going for snack meal happiness and that is generation z but unfortunately if you tell me okay when i speak for one minute you give me applause wow i am great but if there is no applause come on i made a mistake somebody is not looking at me i am looking for snack meal happiness and this has been cultivated at the age of probably in the womb it is not a bad idea however we need to accept and follow the traditional rules gratitude thank you today i am happy because i am alive and from there we embrace technology i can tell you the the hard rule because myself being a trainer also when i started my day one after the first sessions there has been a practice every session there is a feedback and teachers were taking this as a haunting task because come on you are not looking at me therefore my job is at stake or i am in trouble or somebody's principal son or management trustee's son is studying here so i have to be pally pally with them the whole concept of feedback has become extreme mathematical we are missing on the emotions we are missing on basics so if you ask me ma'am uh, do you think there is a holistic answer the answer is we must look at rubrics but rubrics is rubrics means measurements is for improvement as you said about the bloom's taxonomy level so we have to grow up now i end with one line that the day i started my career which was in 2004 after the first session my management people were there they called me and said vinod i appreciate your class but whom are you talking for you are talking for yourself or the audience which means students why are you talking alone ask in between small small questions i appreciate your ideology of waking up and this waking up need not be a hard physical thing in a class come on let's stand up do some exercise thank you suddenly my entire brain ideology will change especially i remember with all due respects to my history teachers so when history teachers are coming to the class you'll say oh my god <laughs> it's not history it is how i perceive but now if you look at go to museums we enjoy so measurement and technology is always an amazing work but i request i appeal to the management to faculty to all people including students please do not treat this as stick treat it as carrot and stick thank you right so that was something which was really really good snack meal happiness right shift the cognitive shift is very very important the moment teacher gets into the class what happens the child is in a different mindset and when you begin something with that frame of mind we don't know whether the child is still there in the class or not so that was something uh, which is good and that's where even before we talk about the assessment you know the anxiety the stress what builds in you know just before just a word test you know today is a test and imagine what goes on in that child's mind no matter how well you are prepared and what you've done but still there's a lot of thing which is going on as an internal dialogue because tomorrow is a test you have to study for two days tomorrow is your test you have to learn you could can't go out and so it builds not the child's anxiety but it's more of parents anxiety which is transferred i think so that snack meal happiness is a wonderful thing to talk about yes thank you so much sir right so coming back to you know uh, gracie ma'am now i know that you have been coming from a downtown school in assam where you know a lot of new pedagogies which you're trying to implement and i'm sure you're using the technology to a larger extent after all i think uh, after covid i think most of us in the remotest area yesterday as we were listening to the dialogues i think uh, the technology uh how it has an impact on the mental health how it will shift the cognitive shift which is very very important so all those things as we were listening yes everything comes with you know yes and no it all depends upon how we balance those approaches how if we can balance something beautifully it can be a definitely and you know advantage which is there 
So technology can make assessment more accessible and easier for the students who are, you know, uh, who are having maybe, you know, coming from a different background or maybe the children with the different learning needs or the learning style which is there. How do you think technology can help these group of children? And are there anything which you're doing in your school? Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a very pertinent question and I think linked to emotional health of children and coming from a mental health background, I really appreciate this question. Uh, when we are talking about using technology in assessment, always I, w I recommend a judicious use of technology. Like you just mentioned, too much of anything is not good for any of us. So same way, uh, example of what we are doing in our school, my school, is say we have a very basic coding class, screen time for one hour, a next period would be maybe a dramatics class, or maybe we go off for a swimming class. So this balance can definitely be made in the daily academic curriculum, because I'm sure we'll all agree that today it's not just academics, there's a lot of co-curricular and individual development that we are looking for in each of our students. So if we balance the daily schedule, this can definitely be helped. And especially for children with uh, special needs, uh, we, I, I'm sure all schools cater to the needs. So what we do for, uh, especially for, uh, if I can give an example for ADHD or slow learners, we uh, integrate a lot of gamification in the curriculum, maybe for science, math, social studies. So by way of games, they are learning, we are doing the assessment, so both you know, le learning needs are met. But like I said, judicious use. But for, say, for autism spectrum, definitely too much of use of screen time is not recommended, so we use a lot of organic hands-on assessment uh, in the curriculum. So, uh, like you said, I am in one corner of India, even far away from <laughs> Bangalore or Delhi. So, whatever we can use. Uh, but definitely, I think after the COVID pandemic, the world has opened up for us in the northeastern part of India too, in terms of access to, you know, teaching learning tools. So, we are making the best use of whatever we can out there. So, do you have any, like... Uh uh, technology tools which are using as an assessment or is it something which is informal assessment what we use it with? Uh, we are currently using a combination because if you totally do away with pen and paper the parents get a little anxious to be very honest so to keep the parents happy some portion is done by the pen paper and we also go for say if I, I don't want to promote any product but what yeah. is available for us in the Northeast we use the logic kits for uh, logical reasoning mind spark and our children also sit for the Olympiads and since I uh, earlier it was again pen and paper but now because it's you can you know access through the computer I can see I can see in my children my students the anxiety levels are much much coming down because you don't have the educator walking up and down the room. That is what the feedback the students have given. Okay, wonderful. Right, so the gamification, the balance approach, the activities which releases the anxiety level, I think, and that's something which is very, very important. Are we checking on, you know, when it comes to the, you know, the basic assessment is how is the state of mind of the learners, which is very important because it has a direct influence in the way they are going to perform the test or being assessed which is there. So first is how we can shift that cognitive shift which is very important. So when it comes to the social emotional well-being and that's where it plays a major role where we need to first bring in that state of mind which is the peace and the calm, calmness which is very very important along with the other things which are there. Yes ma'am. Thank you so much ma'am for your uh, insights. So what do you think technology, how do you think a technology can be used for instant, when we talk about, so I was talking about the <laughs> insect snack happiness which is there, you know, uh, for the formative assessments which are there, right? 
and helping children to boost engagement and identify knowledge gaps and support further deeper learning which is there. So how do you think the formative assessments can be really helpful for uh, students? No, see, first thing is the form. The first thing is assessment always helps children, whether they agree or parents agree or don't agree, because they themselves know where the gap is and automatically they go on learning. So when we talk about the practice test, practice test also is a kind of assessment. So through practice test also you go on giving practice test and then they go on learning, they know this is my gap and they will fulfill fill the gap and this way they go on learning on their own. So teacher need not, because practice test is something where the, this assessment is not considered from the school perspective or from the management, but it is internal assessment. And this actually helps children to know on their own, okay, this is my gap and I have to read this. Now technology, how it will help? Now I was just reading about chat GPT and how the tutor four is really helping in this in these gaps. So how the teacher can get the feedback teacher can feed the feedback to chat GPT and she gets what is the gap for individual child. Individual child, even in the class, suppose the four subtopics were taught. So out of four subtopics, 20 children out of 50 only understood all four. Remaining 20 understood only three, two. So she also knows, okay, my level, this part was not understood by the majority of students, so I have to repeat this in the class. Same thing happened to the child also. Child knows out of four, he might not have understood that he has not understood. But he knows from the assessment which report he gets that, okay, he has not understood this and he has to study it in a different manner. Maybe he needs a different kind of a support to understand that thing. Because as we all know that every child learns differently and at different pace. So the pace is something which is not considered at the moment in our current teaching scenario. And therefore technology helps because every child can learn at its own pace. So whatever pace it comes to, he can learn at home, he can learn repeatedly using net, using his laptop, using his tab, or, or different kind of things. So this way, his pace can be balanced. And this was not happening in the only classroom teaching. If you miss the class or if you don't understand, you are blank in that particular part of the subject. And then this fear goes on and on. I remember our, our times, physics was a monster for everybody. <laughs> physics paper means, oh my God. Math was to some extent acceptable. But physics, oh my God. Because the reason was that it was a completely abstract concept. Today, we abstract concepts, we can make beautifully through animations, through videos. So today, it is not a problem. But that time, I can really tell you, when we were learning stoichiometry, L glucose and D glucose, it was extremely difficult to understand what is D glucose and what is L glucose, how it turns. So all these things were extremely difficult for us to visualize. But today, there are different models and you understand it so easily. So what I feel that technology is really helping in understanding and clearing the concepts and making child more confident. And therefore, answering yes. It will take some time for him to, you know, understand what he understood and how to answer. So this gap will take little more time for him to bridge so that he will be confident to answer online questions. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think what you really uh, <coughs> got uh, this insight was that every child learns at his own pace, which is very important. And you know, when we talk about the assessment, and if we have the assessment, which is a general assessment, which is spread for the whole class without you know, seeing those gaps which are there, yeah. it becomes difficult uh, sometimes for the teachers to understand where, because not every child learns to walk at the same time, talk at the same time. And sometimes what happens is even for the parents, parents don't come with a parenting manual or a training anytime. 
So when they have the first child, it's so much of expectation and so many things, and they want everything to be, you know, uh, done, and it should be perfect because what I missed out, you know, my child should be doing, and that's what the parents come to school. No, this is something which I had a dream, and I did not do it, and my child should be doing that. And then the school is like, okay, no, we need to fulfill each time, you know, parent's dream, and we want to provide, and in the whole race, what happened, the child is lost. So that's where I think uh, even the parents' awareness, yes. we, we know that inside the school, we have a lot of brainstorming sessions, we discuss, we have these kinds of summits where uh, we exchange a lot of ideas which are there, but at the same time, are the parents aware and the parents' awareness program in this respect is very, very important because when we look at the holistic approach, I think all the stakeholders where they come in picture, the parents are the very important pillars of the school. And sometimes we give, you know, okay, these are the guidelines which you need to follow. We are starting with something which is formative assessment. But why? Why are we doing that? Because it's changing. It is evaluating. It is like something which is, a, you know, a requirement for a child. When you're talking about so many things of advance, at the same time, the roots of the holistic approach is equally important because the balance of social emotional well-being plays definitely, definitely a major role in the mental health which is there. So that is there definitely. Yes. Now coming to the next thing, any of you can definitely pick up this question which is there, right? And uh, when we talk about children, what are the some ways where we can reduce the anxiety of teachers first. What are the things we can do? It Because I think that comes first and that's something which is very, very pertinent. Who would like to pick up? Any one of you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, again, golden rule, I'm sure all of us know this, if we keep uh, water half glass full, that's the standard language we will say, rather than half glass empty. And as a teacher, now becoming a trainer, there is a psychological thought. Today I have got 45 minutes. I have to teach module one starting till this, whatever it happens. With that thought I am going because I am assessed by my principal or my head teacher. And from there the damage starts. I am going to a class which has got, as all of you said, scatter plots. Everybody's minds are in different zones. Right now when we are all sitting here, with all due respects to all elite people, I can see your physical body, but impossible to touch your minds. It will be going 10,000 miles away. Can't help it. That's a law of attraction. Our mind will wander. I have to first accept, I am going to meet individuals, not students. Even a small baby at the age of three, her or his mind is amazing. We are sitting here and telling, come on, take this ball. But the baby's retina is here, mind is not here. And then we are trying to say, as a teacher, what should I do? Three cardinal rules which I have applied. Rule number one, I go to a class with an open-ended statement, I know little bit. I learn from every kid. A small, beautiful girl or a boy is coming with a new pencil. Oh, wow, nice pencil. It's amazing. You wrote something? Ask that question. Engage everybody in the crowd. Class will become superb. Superb. Guarantee. Second cardinal rule. I have to complete all portions by myself. No. The ancient scriptures already has said 25% is taught from the teacher. 25% is from the society, 25% is self-learning, 25% life will teach. This is not today, 15,000 years ago people have said it. But what am I doing now? I am doing calculus class, I have to ensure they study everything. Actually they are not, they are mugging up what I am writing. And I am doing an assessment on that, you know this, wow. And what is the tragedy? It is decoupling effect. This mark sheet is shown to the higher education, they get into the campus. Again from there they get A grade, they get into the organization. In the organization it is full of 
unconnected dots where creativity brain mapping is a must but for last 14 to 15 years i have not done it my teacher told me okay differentiation level 1 formula is this then i have to do x minus 1 where is x i don't know in the organization so from where i will subtract so my cutting my theory short first rule i let me go with a very empty handed cool atmosphere by looking at itself the the kid should not be panicked anybody for that matter even if the principal is calling even if the principal is angry let me not be angry because vibes exchange fast second rule i would always encourage is let us try to engage with all audience all people devote 15 minutes of your class for talking 20% try to teach them exactly what it is over a period of time this will be beautiful thing thank you thank you so much i think yeah so engaging all kinds of uh, you know learners in the class i think we need to keep in mind that we have something for the auditory learner something for the visual something for the kinesthetic which is there which is very very important so sometimes we think that a topic like history topic like english how do we talk about the kinesthetic moment which is there and how do we do it and what are the things we can do it which is there i think there are many ways to you know uh, have even these topic interesting with a lot of kinesthetic moment because if you talk about after covid i think our 50 to 60% of the class is moving all around the class and first to make them sit for 5 minutes and have the attention and so on it is so difficult right so getting them to the class and how do we structure a lesson which is very important right so in the structure when we know that we have a class of you know effectively 30 to 40 minutes in that 30 to 40 minutes do i have something which is like as you mentioned something which is a game an activity an introduction and a concept and then we have something which is again you know uh, the little bit of a reading and the writing which is there and the role plays and so on to check on the understanding so if we just plan our structure of the lesson keeping in mind all kinds of learners i think it could go a long way but now when we talk about what should be that balance of technology and when it comes to the assessment which is there how much do you think the percentage and what it should be see i i think that uh, it is definitely should be at least 50% because what i have seen there are human errors there are typo errors and there are so many errors errors which actually impacted so many children's lives and then there is pre uh, reassessment of the papers we have seen pay missing papers all kind of things so this could be avoided if you really have online assessment with some kind of a thing i know that cheating and everything again those things are surfing because of the latest technology however if the assessment method is changed we can definitely use technology very effectively to assess and to give the fair results or the fair assessment report to every child because you know everyone expects that whatever i have done i should get the fair and that is every child not only a child every level so every level everyone expects that i should get the return and if you don't get that frustration that thing and then the humiliation from the peers you know all these things is you know that it really imbalances your emotional quotient so what i feel is every child is really emotional and when they cry and come home there are reasons and many times we don't understand you say okay beta don't cry but the the reason behind the crying is are so different and so deep and many times even parents don't understand why he is crying because many times the cry is due to emotional you know uh, hurting they get hurt they feel no i was right and in spite of that i got wrong answers because this is how i think second thing is the thinking what assessment is doing only one type of thinking whereas some children think differently and if you ask why did you write this or why is your answer like this maybe you will be amazed that his answer was better than someone else's answer but what actually the standard pattern is if this is the answer then you have to give full marks 
And if the answer is not this, then you lose marks. So there, this is the gray area. And actually, this can be removed using technology. OK, thank you. Yeah, so that, yeah, you know, and, and the assessment could be fair. I would say that in many ways, rather than being more subjective and the bias and, you know. Yes. So that is something. So many be. different kind of assessments you can have. Mm -hmm. And based on the topic, again, I, I'm very specific about one thing is, Every topic has a different kind of a learning, and therefore, a, one single assessment doesn't fit for all kind of a pair. Math needs a different kind of assessment, and in the math, algebra needs different kind of assessment, and geometry needs different kind of assessment. But we have the same paper. Yeah. And that is the, this is the problem which is lying in our system, and this has to change. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, I can you know like agree with you that yes. So when it comes to even, uh, you know, having, I would say, the basic assessment, which is there, so when we have the subtopics, as you mentioned, that algebra needs a different this thing, but we just have that one area of assessment, which you say, right? Uh, now, when we're talking about, again, coming back to inclusion, inclusions are taking place at different, uh, I would say, that rates in different countries which are there, now, before considering any digital tool which is there or any kind of, uh, you know, for a student, it is imperative that, you know, the uh, accommodation, the innovation, whatever we are choosing in terms of digital tool is actually for the learner being able to utilize rather than teacher just monitoring the things which is there. Is it for the student or, again, when it comes to the inclusion, Right. What are the things which could be as a part of assessment? Which is there? And, uh, one unique uh, concept I would say we follow in our school is whenever we think of introducing any new, uh, not just assessment, even teaching learning uh, tool, we at the management level of principal doesn't meet with the you know uh, product uh, team we usually take it to the classroom let the students however small smaller grade they are let the students interact you know with the uh, module take their feedback only then we sit for a discussion because why are we teaching to improve student learning, right? Or assessment is for student learning, not just to show a great card, what you just mentioned a while ago, to the parents. Yes, that is there. But end of the day, we are there for the students. If they don't feel at ease, the whole effort goes to waste. I, I, as an ideology, you know, our yeah. school ideology is that is what we follow. So once we get the feedback from the students, that is only when we incorporate or, you know, take up a tool for trial. Same way, even for assessment, uh, we have uh, two major assessments, two minor assessments in our system. After every assessment, we take a feedback from each student, even from our pre-primary, but that is through drawing, coloring, not like a you know regular question assessment. Taking those feedback into consideration, we plan the assessment questions for the next assessment. Yes, it takes time and effort, yeah. but in the long run, we like to call ourselves a happy school. Wonderful. Because students are happy, yeah. your educator's anxiety level comes down, which is another point. Yeah. And one just short thing I'd like to mention here, we, f we maintain a feelings jar in each classroom and even the educator's common room. You're feeling low, you just write whatever, you know, sad, unhappy, confused, put it in that jar. Someone walks in for the uh, classroom, definitely it's the educators. For the you know, common room, it's if I walk in, our uh, you know, administrator walks in, we pick up and we just have a brief, you know, maybe a mindfulness uh, technique or just a quick grounding before we proceed with the rest of the day. So these small techniques have really helped us uh, grow as a school community. Wonderful. I really like the idea of the feeling jar. Similarly, we do have a uh, you know, like the gratitude jar, which we have it in, you know, in our classrooms. And we have the thank you jars, which are there. So these are the three jars, which we always have it, and we put it. So every, every day a child, what did I feel happy about? What I am thankful about? And so those are the things, and I think it's a wonderful uh, 
uh, practice which is there. Right, because see, these are the things we are only talking about here when we blend, how we blend the technology. But whatever said and done, I think the technology, we know that Bangalore, we have a school where you already got the teacher who's a robot, first robot teacher. But uh, yes, in certain ways still, you know, the, in the classroom, technology can't replace the teachers. So that is something which is definitely there. I think I'll just, you know, uh, have your questions for the audience as well, right? So when it comes, if you want to really frame a good assessment, and we want to write, like, these are the things which we really want in the assessment which is there. So we can have the table-wise. What is that one thing, one criteria should be considered? Suppose if you are the education minister, this table, this table, all of you coming from different countries. So you have India, Pakistan, we have, like, say, Australia, and all UK, US, and if I ask you, UAE, right, what is that one thing which you, one criteria you would definitely consider in assessment? Wonderful. And I think that is what the NCF is talking about. The assessment is now not the grades and marks for the primary. It is, you know, the learning levels which are there. Absolutely. So a child shifts from one level to the next level and the next level. So there are four levels, which it started in 1835 and come back, you know, so we have moved around and I think that's what it is there. Wonderful. So yes, so I think four levels of learning which is there, right? Wonderful. And any other table, right? So if we need to consider what is that one thing should not be there in the assessment criteria? What is that one thing which shouldn't be there in the assessment criteria? Yes? Yeah. So uh, assess No memorization. Exactly. Wonderful, right? And I think what is... Uh, so the students, they can go for research. So uh, teachers, they are going to frame such questions. So students, they have to research. So open book tests should be there. Open book assessments or means assignments. Uh, I think so these are uh, really essential for the students. Wonderful. Thank you. Right? So that means, yes, it's not that what a child is learning, where, how, and when a child is learning, where they're learning, which is very, very important. And that's where when CBSE talks about the formative assessment, it is not just the, you know, submitted assessments which are there. So you have to say, so teacher needs to be more observant. Right? So it's not that one day, that one day in a month where you fill in those, uh, you know, columns and put tick, 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 which is there. So it is all, yes? Communication. Yeah. Communication language means when uh, the teacher or the principal communicate with the parents or with the student, what language he uses. Does he use m words like failure? Does he use words like success? Or does he use words like difficulties, support? Language should be more positive, uh, more optimistic, and more supportive to the child. Because the child is in a learning position. When we learn, we fail. And when we learn, we learn from our failures. So I think also that the language that the schools are using when they are communicating with the parents or with the child should be also uh, taken in consideration. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's what it says. No, children have uh, 100 languages of communication which is there. Can a teacher identify in terms of expression when a child is actually, you know, just drawing uh, maybe a curve or a circle or a line and he's talking that this is my family and this is what 
I'm trying to talk about, and this is what my world is. Can I identify that, and can I understand the language what a child is talking about? And that's where, again, the CBS is coming, uh, you know, like in the framework also that why the multilingual, uh, the local language in the first uh, early years, which is very, very important, where a child and the teacher can communicate, you know, and understand. First is, understand me, teacher, then teach me what I need to learn, right? Wonderful, very nice. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am? Mm -hmm. uh, she said that, uh, you know, uh, we have different kinds of questions, but we have the same paper. So I really believe, and in fact, we really put it into practice that uh, I absolutely agree with her because they're all, all the lessons or all the chapters that we teach from various subjects have different kind of questions, but why do we have the same paper where she said that that needs to change? So I want to add to that is uh, the various things that we want to test or we want to assess the children on. So what we do is divide the question paper because we do written. We, we do online as well as written because we want to keep the practice of writing you know, still there and not have the children completely go online. So what I would suggest is, you know, and what we currently do is divide the paper into four different parts. The first part is called the understanding of the knowledge of the subject. The second part is called the understanding of the lesson, the understanding. The third part is called the application-based part of the lesson or the lessons. And the final part of the question paper will have high order thinking skills. So if the question paper is divided in four different categories and it covers the aspects that the teacher taught in various chapters that we have done during the term, I think every child has the ability to attempt those four different parts of the question paper and he or she would, because of course when it is application based, you might have diagrammatic questions and even when it is high order thinking skills, you might have some questions which lead to your audiovisual sense that, you know, like we said, all children are different. So if this is the format of the paper, then I believe, uh, you know, we can do wonders with children and give them a lot of scope to improve upon the part of the assessment that we are looking at. And I think that's essential and it's very important because like we said, every child learns differently. So every child answers also differently. Different. Yeah? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for, and I think for that, that means now the way we are actually preparing our questionnaire or the question set, which is very important, yeah. right? Are our teachers actually trained to do that? So that comes the next question, which is there. Okay, we are trained to do certain things in a certain way, which is there. So what is that one thing which you would definitely, if you are today, you know, governing the education system, and the entire education ecosystem which is there. What is that one thing which you will definitely include for your teachers as part of assessment? What will you do that? What kind of professional development? Training for setting papers. <laughs> Wonderful. And what is one thing which teachers should avoid while, while preparing the assessments or the question paper? What is that one criteria which teacher should avoid? What is that one thing? How, how, how can we make it a little easier? Because I know that maybe one school is having a lot of resources and a lot of teachers are doing it. What about the schools where they have the limited resources and how can we do that? How can we do that so that we can definitely bring in the best of the pedagogies, the best of the things which could be? So a lot of collaboration, a lot of sharing, a lot of learning, and I think that could be the collaboration in terms of when we talk about the collaboration, what kind of collaboration are we talking about? Because again here, the cultural, the cultural biases, then the social environment also plays a very, very critical role in the entire process. So maybe if we have something for the, you know, the urban set, set up which is there and maybe the same textbook, 
same thing might not work for the rural setup as well. So how, how can we have that, that kind of, yeah. by student learning outcomes, so uh, they will help us to set such assessments so everybody can do it. Rather, uh, even it's regional or cultural, but uh, SLOs, they are going to set. So what is that one thing which we can have it, which could be uh, globally accepted as a standard of assessment, no matter where from a child is coming from, which background, which, which country, what language, what is it one thing each and every assessment can have it which can be globally accepted? Creativity. Continuous yes. assessment through the year. What? Is? And, and the. I like what Kiri said, yeah. said, but I, I would uh, feel that. Uh, somewhere or somehow the application-based questions and the HOTS, which is the high order thinking skills, that could be one and the same in some form. It's application-based. I personally feel that the fourth path could be 25% oral. It helps in the speaking skills. There are children who, who cannot write. And just an observation about the assessment system. Uh, in the whole, I come from India, from the whole country. The whole school system, not just the assessment system, is very parent-oriented. Everything is to please the parents. Forget the children, forget the teachers. And sadly, I don't know how many management people are here. It's sad that the, the standard of the school is to do with the admissions that come. And the admission only comes with the number of 90 percenters you get. And the whole assessment criteria is going crazy in trying to bring those 90 percenters. And the, the student fraternity is suffering. People are forgetting about those great schools that make a 40 percent into a 60 percent, and a 60 percent into a 62 percent. It's an achievement. So the whole assessment system, I believe, I personally believe, and the big question is, does it need to be reformed or transformed? And that could be a whole debate in itself. Yeah. And in the end, what happens after all these conferences? We go back <laughs> and we are back to square one so because is nothing is in our control. Yeah, but I think it all starts from me, I. I would say that, okay, we know that everything begins with I. What is that one thing maybe I can do it? And from my side, which is there in my, you know, capabilities in terms of the resources available around me, so if we want each one of us, we have that one step taking, I think the things can change. So what is, what is that we can do it? We know that it is all what you said, that it is more for the parents. How can we change sir, that situation? What can we do? Parents need counseling, and I'm very much with the CBSE. <laughs> Primary school, no exam. A continuous assessment of how the child is going through yeah, the year. Uh, just to add to uh, what sir just said, I am part of the management. I am not a school principal. I'm, of course, a parent, but I am part of the management. And like what ma'am just mentioned, we start with I. So for admissions, we do not meet with the students first. We meet with the parents, the would-be parents, and that's how we start with the admission process. Definitely, so it's a very small step, but change can be brought in as a community. But we, you know, small steps. So we start with parent uh, meet, and then we go on to meet the student. So numbers don't play a role for us in One admissions. Step. Very nice. Thank you for sharing. And I think that's where the parents' uh, uh, counseling, when it comes to counseling, it is more of one-to-one. -one. And no parents, if you ask that, OK, a group of 20 parents coming to your school, that these are the children who are a little weaker or maybe not able to cope up with the academics, you call them separately. No parents want to show up there. If it has to be in general, uh, the parents' awareness that there are red flags which they need to be aware of. Many of times, the parents are not even aware. Forget the parents, the teachers. Teachers are not aware of you know how and what and how do I identify the number of children with the you know learning differences, right? I think that is on rise. The autistic children which have moved from three to now the 9% uh, 
but are the teachers, you know, even aware of the what are the red flags and how it can be? Yes, yes. Sir. That's again a yeah, long debatable yes. subject, which is there, definitely. Yeah, right? Yes, definitely what you said, sir, yes. And in our institute as well, not only the teachers, but we also have once in a week parents coming to the school, sitting in the same class, seeing how and what the processes are, which has also helped us in a long way, which is there. So definitely it's a, the assessment is again, you know, ongoing process, which has been going through a lot of changes and we are trying to see that still how we can bring out the best and balance the best of whatever is available in terms of pedagogy, in terms of technology, which can be used with the balanced approach. I think keeping in mind the diverse learners coming from the various background which is there. Wonderful, very nice, I think, yeah. yeah. Uh, one second, ma'am. Uh, if you ask me from a very practical point of view, what can I do as a teacher? This is again a rough statement. I make my point, but I'm doing it for the last 14 years. None of my question papers will have define. It's a hard rule. In, in our define. entire, I am in university and we are mandating any teacher. In fact, we have got senior professors who have written define. We have canceled the question paper. He said, you can't ask define. Because definition is already there. Application or thought. Illustrate. Elucidate. With an example. Where the content need not be validated. Where the thought. For example, what is this water bottle all about? Can I make it in a different shape and market it? That's what organizations are looking for. I'm not looking for the size and the dimension. Yes, if I'm in a chemistry background, I should. But in certain subjects, we are mandating, we are in management and disciplines, but we are mandating, let us try to have those certain papers, especially in mathematics. There is proof and theorem, we can't change it. So we said there is a cap. 15 percentage is only direct questions, which align to the higher order thinking skills. So which might help all, you know, slow learners, advanced learners and things like that. This can be easily implemented at my own level. As a teacher, I frame the question paper. I'm not talking about end exams, but continuous exams. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can I add something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think at the end of the every year, even a school should have a feedback from every student. What did they feel about assessments? I think that feedback probably doesn't come to the school. It has to come, and there is one more suggestion to all the management, even the students pass out from 10th, 12th, whatever, you have to monitor what do they do. Lot of our alumni associations do that, but schools really do not do. You should know what, what is you are, I mean the impact of your education or your learning, which learning outcome has really impacted the society. So where do they stand today? Five years down the line, what the child is doing. Ten years down the line, what the child is doing. Till date, I, my entire data is with Bombay IIT, ma'am. What I am doing is with Bombay IIT, 
because I'm alumni and they can constantly monitor us. We have to give what we are doing and constantly we get the, you know, those kind of a things. So what I suggest that this will help schools honestly that, okay, I, we are performing, but my, my school and my, I mean, students really are benefited and the society at large is benefited from my whatever learning happened in my school. This is lacking today in the school environment. So this is my suggestion, ma'am, that please create this kind of a data because now data has no problem. Data analysis, analytics has no problem and we should collect that data and we should really monitor and this will really help in long term, even for the school also, to prove that, yes, we are at the top. So, yes, data, yes, again, the data and uh, the analytical data, and to compare the data and the resources, and that's where I think the technology again yes. comes very handy, to see those gaps, which is manually sometimes not possible, and I think it's doable with you there. Wonderful, I think, uh, to sum it up, uh, one closing, the assessment, if I ask the audience, the assessment should be what? Formative. One word. Yep. Can we have a mic there? Communication with parents during assessment is not easy. You have parents who have high expectations. And they have this vision on their, on their child. And they, see, and they see this vision inside of their head projecting to the future. So when you are in front of them and telling them that this vision is no longer, it's not easy. This first. So, I think what said Mr. about having the guts to take two teachers and take care of some students who need more help, more. like special needs and everyone. It's not easy also for parents to know that their child will be in this class. That's the second problem in the assessment. When you tell them in the assessment, your child cannot be in a regular class. And the third one, is the vision. Each uh, school has a vision towards his, uh, its students. The vision, what careers should they have, and the vision about their academic, yeah. uh, what they're gonna give as academic results. So if the vision, with the vision of the parents, we see the parents support uh, the school. When the vision is not aligned, we see parents coming and coming back to complain about few details, that and this. But in the end, why? Because they are not satisfied. So the, the, the problem is, do we have the same expectations as the parents? How do we install a win-win situation? where I and the parents, I, the administration, and the parents have the same goal. How do I do that? Does the teacher understand this vision, this mission? Sometimes the student is just the victim. And sometimes the parents don't have this knowledge about where they are going. They know it's a good school. Let's put our uh, kids here. And sometimes the administrations want to communicate but she doesn't know how. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think that's what is important, that what, how do we convey, coming back to where we started, like what is the purpose of that assessment and why we are doing it? Is it for the student, teachers, parents, or what it is? So that will make uh, definitely a law. Once we know that we align with the vision and the dream of whatever a child is aspiring for, I think the things become more clear, and that has to be keeping in mind all the stakeholders which are there. Right? Okay, so yes, anybody else? Last closing remarks for the assessment? The things, yes, the formative, 
you know, even though it's, it's for the students and not for the parents, and I think the parents' awareness program, and then how do we reduce the, you know, the anxiety level where we talk about the emotional well-being of not only the students, but also as teachers, which is there, keeping in mind the different, uh, you know, learning styles and different kinds of learners in a class. We have different approaches which are there, and that is something which is very, very important, all the points, right? Good, wonderful. I think it has been a really, really wonderful morning and a lot of insight from all the audience. You all were just fabulous and a big round of applause for all of you. Thank you.